Johnson actually live streaming on YouTube? I believe she is, and thus we all believe in miracles. Welcome back to the tennis vlog. My words, how long has it been? It has been, I will guarantee it, I don't know the exact numbers, it's been the longest break I've ever had on this channel, so if you've actually taken the time to come back, thank you very much. And thank you for being here across the years and also happy five year anniversary because in the time that I've been absent from the channel, this channel hit five years of age. That would have been in either March or April. I started this as a university project way back when and you've seen me go from student to Grand Slam commentator. So <laughs> quite the journey. Thank you for being here for it and apologies because I know that a lot of people are not going to be able to be here live. It's tough when viewers are coming from all different parts of the world to schedule a live stream where everyone can get there at the same time. So I'm hoping that if you can't catch all of it live, maybe you can catch some of it. And as ever, uh, the final video will be live on the channel afterwards and you can actually skip through at that point because I'll put in those chapters where you can skip the bits that you're not interested in, which is probably good for the short attention spans because we know what I'm like or do we remember I'm not sure thank you very much for those that have left comments in advance I saw them coming in they're not all here but I think I've got them stored away so those who've asked questions I'll try and get across them over the course of the next let's say the next hour or so I'll try and hang here for uh, we've got a grand slam to discuss that is upcoming we've got a few weeks of tennis to look back on uh, it's all happening in the tennis world it always is let's be real so <laughs> we'll break some of that down and uh, we'll just have a, a nice a nice little casual chat here I want you to get involved in the discussion now I'm gonna to kick things off here I'm gonna explain a little bit about why I haven't been on the channel and what I've been up to over the past few months I will mark that as one of the chapters so if you come at a later date and that bores you to tears you can skip but just so anyone who doesn't follow me on social media knows where the heck I've been I'll get that out of the way first and foremost and then we'll uh, get to discussing the, the more interesting matters let's say um, if you can confirm as well that you can hear me as always it's a new device again you can't trust me with anything my other phone went to pieces so <laughs> let's see if this one holds up time will tell keep those comments coming in I'll be getting across them don't you worry and a little bit on where I've been then so I was last with you I believe at the end of last season I actually put up a video on Emma Raducanu and Paola Bedosa who both scored big titles and I'd watched them compete at an ITF event a couple of years prior um, I, you got that video to I think 10,000 views and I barely did any promotion on that so cheers to everyone that gave that the time of day that gives you actually a good clue as to where I've been because my focus at times has been elsewhere as opposed to ATP and WTA tennis all the time so I've done a lot of work in the UK at domestic events you might have heard of the league I work on called the UK Pro League I've spoken about that previously Emma Raducanu and Liam Brody won the thing in 2020 and I'm very committed to that so that's across the season at intervals um, and I, over the past few weeks I've been at a lot of ITF events in the UK it's been really good to see international tournaments finally coming back to the UK after the pandemic and coming back in force as well I think over the last few years we've seen with nations like the United States and Italy they've got tournaments in their country all year round and you cannot underestimate the impact that has in terms of giving players a platform allowing them to compete at home save on expenses not have to worry so much about logistical issues and just give them the home advantage when they're competing that has given a lot of players legs up over the past few seasons and I think we're seeing the same now with the UK so that's been very interesting for me uh, but I have done work as well on ATP and WTA tennis just because I've not been here it doesn't mean I haven't been involved at the back end of last year I was commentating regularly for ATP tennis radio which is sadly no more for the time being might come back in the future uh, but that covered the Masters 1000 events in the ATP finals so I commentated on them at the back end of last season 
which built up to the biggest trip of my life, going to Melbourne for the Australian Open in January, which was unbelievable. I was commentating on Rod Laver Arena matches, so I had the best seat in the house, in line with the baseline, players like two meters away, the kind of jobs that you just work for and dream for. So that was incredible and so insightful to get to my commentary box. I was going through the match call area where all the players for the show courts get ready to go on to court. Uh, you see them pre-match and you see them after the match as well. I was shoulder to shoulder with Rafa Nadal after he beat Denis Shapovalov in, in the match that I thought really indicated that he was going to go on and, and win the event. Comes out of the gym shaking his head in disbelief that he managed to get that done after being two sets to love up and then Chapeau closing back. So yeah, amazing experiences, lots of different things going on. Hence, I haven't been here, but now I'm back. So we get down to business. And this is why I want you guys to be so much involved in this video as well, because as I've been doing uh, lots of different things elsewhere, pains me, cuts my soul to admit this, but this is the, the least clay court tennis I have ever watched, I'm gonna say prior to Roland Garros. I've watched some key matches. I've not been deeply involved. So I'd be very curious to know who you think are the players to watch leading into the event and maybe some lesser expected names to look out for as well. So I can see the questions are coming in. Thank you very much. I'm going to get across them and I'm gonna, there, there were questions here before, I don't know what happens, they just poof, they disappear. I'm trying to think what they were off the top of my head, but I'm, I'm running on minimal sleep as usual again, and that they're not coming. So I'm gonna start with what's here, and if you were here previously and left a question, feel free to put it in there again. What have we got? Thank you to everyone who's come back and who's been here over the years. Uh, do, 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 do. What other tournaments would I like to tick off my list? Uh, I, I can't say 100% for certain what I'm doing because the whole thing is carnage at the moment, as we know, but I should be working on Wimbledon in a broadcast capacity. I'll let you know more in time. And if you want to stay on top of what I'm doing, you should follow me on my social media. So at Abigail Tennis on Twitter and Instagram is the one these days, to be honest, if you, if you want to know where I am and what I'm doing, that, that is the place to be. So, plug. Uh, <laughs> here we go then, Let, let's get down to it. Um, predictions for Roland Garros. We, we go straight in there, do we? Okay, let's go. Uh, fun times. Do you know what? I think it's pretty, in terms of actually making a prediction, I don't think it's too tough this time around. It's crazy to say that, right? Let's start with the women's side. There's been a lot of shifting and changing within women's tennis in recent months. I was gutted to see Ashley Barty retire. I, I mean, I think she did the best thing for herself. She'd never been entirely comfortable with the whole living out of a suitcase thing, being away from home so much. We know this. And it's actually really cool that she ended things on her own terms the way she did. Uh, just swaggered off with a Grand Slam title on each of the three surfaces and the world number one ranking and finished it at the top of the pyramid. Why the heck not? So good for her. I thought not so good for the tour because up to that point I'd been saying that the WTA tour is about five or six Ashley Barty's away from being the ideal tour and then she went and I'm like, Oh, great, well now there's no Ash Barty's. Oh, she brought so much, she could carry the target, she could handle the pressure, great versatile serve, which routinely held up with her back against the wall, the backhand slice, the aggressive forehand, it, it was just brilliant. And it looked like it was taking very little out of her, but she didn't have the motivation, so you can't say how many Grand Slams she was gonna win more. So there was a lot of weight on Iga Sviantec's shoulders because she picked up that world number one ranking by default, really. Barty opted for her name to be taken off the rankings in Step Sviantec. And there was definitely an asterisk there. there. There were definitely question marks and she has absolutely smashed them. Full credit to her. Wish she'd started a bit earlier, not gonna lie. On AR Radio, I said quite confidently that she was 
gonna beat Danielle Collins in semi-finals. She lost that match, but she's barely lost a match since. Uh, she's on a ridiculous run. She's won 28 straight matches. And in a, in a tour that has been so unstable for so long, outside of Barty from time to time, it, what she's been able to do and the way she's been able to do it with so much of the spotlight so quickly thrust upon her, she's got to be given so much credit for that. And because of the way she's handled that, she's actually definitely the favourite for me going into Roland Garros. Now, those that have followed the channel for a long time will know that I'm always quite sceptical ahead of a major, particularly on the women's side. In fact, maybe exclusively on the women's side, I would say that the players who are performing prior to the tournament should not be the picks to go all the way, particularly if they've won the week prior to the event, because then they're short on rest time. But I mean, as we saw with Emma Raducanu at the US Open, it, it tends to be a lesser known suspect that goes all the way to the trophy. That said, the players that are performing well ahead of the tournament on the women's side generally are not winning five or six straight titles, they're winning one or two, which is very different to the consistency and the ruthlessness, really, that Sviantec has shown over the past two or three months. So for me, with the with the way she's been able to handle herself and keep her focus, I don't see how you outright pick anyone against her until she's shown herself that there is reason for doubt, which she hasn't, and she's won seven of the eight WTA finals that she's contested and that is the most high pressure situation that you're going to face a final where there's a trophy on the line so for me looking at her as someone that has won this tournament before in 2020 I've actually got a lot of confidence in her going into this one uh, particularly after earlier today I was a little behind on matches so I rewatched the Rome final against uh, Ange Dugour and what was very interesting there was how alert and ready she was for the key moments over and over started quickly put the pressure on and then i was taking particular note of the 30 all points a lot of times people uh, kind of look at the break points uh, saved break points won but if you looked at the uh, the 30 all points in that match i, I wrote it down where is it I, I think there were eight 30 all points and she won seven of them so there she's given herself breathing room time and time again and she's pinpointed the exact moment to step up to put pressure on the scoreboard so it's things like that that really set her apart from the rest of the field she's far from the only player that can play high quality tennis but she knows how to sustain it when it really matters in terms of threats to her i'm looking at the likes of bianca andrescu who's been injured for the majority of her career the way she managed to snatch that us open title in the meantime very impressive because even in that 2019 season she was so up against it so full credit to andrescu you've got to look when it comes to people that can threaten Sriontek at players that can really switch it up now jagur is a prime suspect but her her nature i feel is sometimes to sit back a bit she's got a great one-two punch when she's really willing to go after it but once the rallies extend she, I feel at times she can become a little bit passive and you need to have the full mix of being able to knife that ball and use the length of the court, but also really step up and swing when you get the opportunity. And I noticed in that Rome match that anything that was kind of half-hearted from Jagur or not quite precise, Sriantec was all over it. So I'm looking at the likes of Bianca Andrescu and Barbora Krajikova, who won last year. There's a reason she won last year, not just her willpower, but her versatility and I feel like herself and Andrescu are really the kinds of players that have the full range that could potentially just draw Sriantec out of her comfort zone and get her frustrated. She's won a lot of these matches quite straightforwardly. So if she's really up against it in a tense battle on a big stage, how does she respond there? Those are the big questions. How long did I spend answering that? We're back to the old ways, fantastic. Let's be a bit quicker on the men's side. Oh my word, is that even possible? So, times have changed on the ATP tour. Did I ever think I would say this? I'm not sure I did. But um, th there's a new kid in town. You know his name. Uh, and in fact, I was watching him live in Roland Garros last year. That was the first Grand Slam I commentated on. I was sat courtside as Carlos Alcaraz lost in straight sets to Jan Leonard Struff. He comes into this year at 19 years old. 
as one of the favourites. And to be completely honest with you, did I ever think I would be saying this about a male teenager at a Grand Slam? He's fully earned that tag. I mean, he's a joke. He's so complete, physically, mentally, before he's even entered his 20s. I mean, hats off. So he's up there, but there, are, there is a, a Rafael Nadal to consider and a world number one Novak Djokovic. So I'm looking at those three names. This is nothing earth shattering. This is nothing that's going to blow anyone's mind because I, I think that anyone who has been aware of what's been going on in tennis in recent times is going to come to the same conclusion. The difficulty that you have there is that they've all fallen into the same half of the, the Roland Garros men's single straw, which is quite typical. So it's a little bit top heavy, that draw. Uh, Djokovic and Nadal are on track for that quarter final meeting. Alcaraz potentially awaiting whoever's in the semi finals. Who would I pick out of those three? And he, here I haven't even mentioned Stefano Tsitsipas, who made final last year and was two sets to live up on Novak Djokovic, or Alexander Zverev, who I feel has proven himself across surfaces for a number of years. Daniil Medvedev, who was kind of getting over his hatred of clay last year. I mean, there are a lot of names to consider. I, the ATP a few years back was getting so much criticism for a lack of depth which is totally not the case these days. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly strong tour that they've got going on, but there are, I feel, three standout names this time around when it comes down to belief, mentality and physicality over best of five sets. And it is kind of mind blowing to me that I can say that about a 19 year old, because for years I've said that I will not kind of hype anyone up until they've beaten the likes of Federer or Nadal or Djokovic over a best of five set match at a Grand Slam. But bit by bit, Alcaraz is ticking off every challenge that you could possibly set him. He's won all the clay court tournaments he's played leading into Roland Garros, very smartly skipped Rome as well, just to give himself the time to get ready for the big one. Indian Wells champion. I mean, it's been an incredible rise. Would I pick him over Nadal or Djokovic? I don't know. I I don't know. And it's kind of amazing that I can even say that because I've always gone in and said Nadal every single year at Roland Garros, even 2015, when he was having his toughest season, probably of his career in 2015. And there was a lot of reason to doubt him that season. And I did, but I still went with Nadal based on the comfort that he finds at Roland Garros and on the clay of Paris. I, I thought, well, surely he finds a way, but straight sets for Djokovic in the quarterfinals. Obviously, I say obviously, maybe you're not aware, but there are injury concerns surrounding Nadal this year with the, the foot and the back. And that just reminds me of a question that was asked previously um, by someone. So I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. Um, yeah, it's interesting the similarities between now and that 2015 season where Nadal lost to Djokovic in the quarters. They're now on track for a meeting in the quarters. Djokovic not looking as strong as he did that season, it must be said, because of his stance on the vaccine. He's had to miss a number of tournaments, including Australian Open, which was absolute carnage in January, but that, that is the norm now in this sport. So, But he, he won Rome, so he's come back into form. So you, you definitely can't write Djokovic off as undercooked. I think it, it, it comes down to those three, Nadal, Djokovic and Alcaraz, and I wouldn't pick a name at this point. It was very interesting to me being on site in Paris last year and staying for the night sessions, which were a new introduction last year, very unfortunately for the event, because it was still kind of during the back end of the pandemic. And they introduced a curfew in Paris where everyone had to leave the site by 9 p.m. But I was working so I could stay and I'd be one of about 10 to 20 people sat on court for Luke Sheffield watching Djokovic and Nadal and whoever else was playing. It was amazing. Uh, but one thing I noted when Nadal was playing Gasquet, Richard Gasquet, in round two was how the temperature dropped so suddenly. I can't remember what time it was, but it was between about the hours of, let's say, half nine and half ten plummeted and when the temperature dropped the bite was kind of taken off Nadal's shots and and that kind of 
sent alarm bells for me and I thought well if, if he comes up against the like, likes of Djokovic he could be in trouble and he was he was also injured yeah but he, he was in trouble so I, I don't think that's a good introduction for Nadal as much as he's king of clay he does like familiarity and he has actually struggled in times past when he goes to a venue and expects it to be a certain kind of condition and and it's not that it's either heavier or it's wetter or it's colder and that's when he struggles because we see no doubt with his water bottles and lining them up and these little superstitious rituals that he has he, he likes familiarity so it really kind of rocks his boat when he goes somewhere and he expects it to be a certain situation and it's not that said he completely steered the ship to win Roland Garros 2020 when it was in the autumn but I did just have that feeling about him last season so I, I think that could be tricky for him he's got that nasty draw on top but in times gone by when the questions have been asked he has risen up so yeah we might talk a little bit more about this later in the video I've spent way too long on it but it's interesting it's a, it's a very interesting lead up to uh, the clay court major this year and I'm here for it I think it's great the state of men's tennis right now okay so so we got going <laughs> rather nicely uh, thanks for keeping the comments coming in keep them coming um I am I'm just scrolling down uh do you th oh here we go do you think Nadal could have planned better this is an interesting question by not playing Indian Wells which caused him an injury otherwise he would have been in Stefano Tsitsipas' place in the draw. So Nadal is seeded fifth, which is why he's on the same half of the draw as Djokovic and Alcaraz and those guys, um, as opposed to the the Tsitsipas half, which I've got to say, there are still some dangers in there for Tsitsipas. I mean, Medvedev was finding his feet. I know Tsitsipas won that semi-final last year, but um, I wrote a few names down. Who have you got in there? Andre Rublev, Yannick Sinner, Mimir Kachmanovic, he was really stepping up uh, across the last few weeks. Uh, and the Stefano Tsitsipas opening round, Lorenzo Musetti. So there's a meeting there of the two players who were two sets to love up on Novak Djokovic during the event last season. Arguably should have finished him off. One of them's not going beyond round one, so that's a really interesting opener. But to actually get back, I'm a shambles, seriously. To get back to the question that was actually asked, uh, which is, do you think Nadal could have planned better? Look, I, I think that, look, Nadal's in his mid-30s now. You Rarely do you find a competitor that's better at planning. I think because he loves the game so much and wants to be around for such a long time, he's been very careful with this stuff over the years. And he was going for something incredible there. This is a guy who has won multiple majors on hard courts, and statistically has been one of the best hardcore players over recent years, but because of his clay court dominance, his ability on hard courts has been played down so much. And there he was at Indian Wells with the potential to enter the clay court for the first time in his career at the age of, how old is he, 35? At the age of 35, not having lost a match on a hard court. And that would have included a Grand Slam trophy um, I, I think 500 level trophies and a Masters 1000 trophy at the very prestigious Indian Wells. So in my mind, 100% right for him to, to try and play that Indian Wells event. And he only picked up the, the injury really, or it only flared up the way it did at the back end of the tournament. So he had a brilliant win over Alcaraz in the semi-finals and then was hampered in the final against Taylor Fritz, which was... Oh, it was tough to see because he was he was so close to what would have been a phenomenal achievement. But I think at, at this point in time, Nadal doesn't know how long he's got left. And, and that was a a huge bit of um, history in terms of his own career and his state status as one of the greatest. That was a massive thing to be going for, even though he'd already won a Grand Slam title to get into that clay swing with the Australian Open and Indian Wells titles under his belt. That would have been huge. So... And to quote Nadal himself, uh, we can't predict the future or not. I, I can't do his accent, but he said that at Wimbledon in like 2019. Uh, we, we can't tell what's going to happen in the future. He had no idea that that was going to flare up. And he wasn't going to play Miami the week afterwards anyway. He's smart enough to know that he's not managing 
two such high intensity events back to back leading into the clay court swing which is his forte so yeah it's unfortunate it's unfortunate that he got injured but there's no way he could have predicted that so yeah i i think that he scheduled as best he could and interesting question but no if he was to go back in time i think he'd do the same again really uh wow okay D does a wimbledon win count in grand slam numbers for example if novak djokovic wins will it be 21 grand slam trophies for him despite zero ranking points um if we're going completely by statistics here yeah it still counts it's still a major i was having this conversation with a, a few people earlier today i was down in london at the national tennis center um yeah it's still a grand slam it, ranking points do not make it a grand slam its status as an itf event is what makes it a major one of the four majors so 20 years down the line ranking points or not it's still just going to say so and so winner at the championships that that's not changing so yes if Djokovic wins the tournament he will still have 21 grand slam titles even if he loses the world number one ranking by losing his points it's a very sad and a very frustrating situation and uh i'm actually not going to comment on it unless someone asks directly if you do then i will but i'm not going to throw myself in the that deep end at this point in time uh so we move on <laughs> to the next question uh coco goff's chances question mark she has a nice draw it seems ah coco goff i feel sorry for coco goff um, I've seen recently uh, some comparisons between the hype that uh, Carlos Alcaraz is getting and the hype that she got way back when now in 2019 when she was 15 years old and she made the fourth round of Wimbledon. I didn't see those two as comparable at all. Um, Alcaraz, you know, he didn't have the titles at the beginning of this season but you could see that he had such completeness of physical and mental game. I actually commentated on the match that turned it all around for Alcaraz. I was on ATP Tennis Radio back end of last year, Paris Masters, and he was five love up on Hugo Gaston in the second set, and he lost seven straight games. And the Paris Masters is vicious. I mean, you think Roland Garros can get bad. Like the Paris Masters is an indoor event, so you've got the roof on, you've got an enclosed stadium, and <laughs> late at night they really give it the crowd like that atmosphere is a joke and it, it can get really quite on top of you and there's Alcaraz a young player relatively inexperienced still at that point Gaston's gaining he's probably one player who can really rival Alcaraz for execution of the drop shot and he was getting in with that shot and he was watching the Alcaraz forehand come undone Alcaraz left uh, that match in tears like he was broken and I remember saying on the mic this result will make him and he's not been the same player since he, he lost to Matteo Berrettini in five sets in the third round of the Australian Open very very high quality match and he's barely lost a match since uh, it's been stupendous my, my whole point with saying that is that I don't see any comparison between Alcaraz and Goff because Goff's the, the Goff hype it was blown out of proportion because she was a 15 year old kid in terms of the draw that she actually came through to to make that Wimbledon fourth round hobbled Venus Williams in round one uh what, what was it um what's her name she's retired now someone tell me what round two was it it began with an M and the second name might have begun with an R uh was it Nikulescu was it Monica Nikulescu I don't know but someone in round two and then Polona Herzog in round three which was a match that she should actually have lost like Herzog double fault in a match point and then she got routined by Halep so Goff and this is why I feel sorry for her and this is what I was trying to say at the time she was announced way too early the potential was there and that's right she she had a lot of potential but she was announced as the present when she was still the future and that put a lot of expectation on her shoulders and i think therefore she got to a point where i remember watching her lose pretty comprehensively i think last year at wimbledon to angelique kerber and she looked so defeated walking off the court when that was a perfectly respectable result kerber was back in top form former champion 
right Barakova, thank you very much i knew it was there it was on the tip of my tongue it was right Barakova she played in um second round that's the one and quite a tricky player to be fair but nothing like the types of player that Alcaraz has been coming through. I mean, heck, he beat Nadal and Djokovic back to back on the way to the Madrid title. Who does that? It's insane. So, yeah, I think it was all too much too soon for Goff. And all things considered, I think she's done well. She's She's gone steady and she's steadily improved her game. But there was no kind of flash of lightning because that, that shouldn't have been expected in the first place. Now, in terms of her draw, I've, I've not gone kind of shoulder deep into the women's draw, but she's she's not in the Sviantec half I don't think so if that's the case then you, you can consider it pretty open I mean I, I said it last year before Emma went and won the US Open I remember saying on a live stream a qualifier could literally win a Grand Slam and then it only went and happens so it's uh yeah it, it's one of those things where it is it's very open and she's got as good a chance as any. Last year, I recall, she made the quarterfinals because that was her first major quarterfinal at Roland Garros. And she lost to Barbora Kozikova. And um, I hope they don't mind me saying this. I was actually talking to a, a member of Kozikova's team at the time after that match. And uh, I think that they felt that Goff actually had maybe a little bit more in her locker there and more ability to win the match but she didn't know what she was doing there was like a lack of focus and tunnel vision there and so she wasn't able to keep a hold of the reins of the match so if she can be in a position where she's got good chances against the player that eventually went on to win the tournament last year and my word did that draw open up last year i mean krajikova pavlyuchenkova grand slam final i i love krajikova as a player but you're not anticipating that as a major final, it must be said. So, yeah, I, th I think that, you know, I think that Goff still has developing to do. I feel like she's still at that position in her career where she's beating the players you would expect her to beat, but then is struggling when she comes up against a really top player, like a Grand Slam champion or a top 10 player. Um, but she's got to break through at some point if she carries on at this trajectory so i i don't not necessarily sure that i would call it here but if you're saying that she has a good draw and she is kind of at the moment beating the players you would expect her to beat i yeah she she might be a good shout so interesting stuff guys interesting stuff keep it coming how long have we half an hour let's do half an hour more uh thank you to everyone who's back i'm glad to be back as well um Oh, I actually, I skipped it. Someone someone asked um, thoughts on Wimbledon having uh, no ranking points. I, I conveniently skipped over that. I, I genuinely, I, I did not see it before. I've just jumped to see it. Um, how much do I say here? It, look, it, the whole situation is so sad and so tricky and so sensitive. I, I'm not going to go deep, deep into this. And, and maybe it would have been a good thing if no one had gone deep, deep into this in the first place. And maybe it would have saved everyone a, a lot of problems. Um, I don't think any decision has been made in bad faith. I, I don't think any decision has been made with the wrong intentions by Wimbledon or by the ATP and WTA in terms of stripping ranking points i don't i don't think that anything has had ill motive i think that the atp and wta were in a very difficult situation because one way or another there was not going to be a level playing field if we stopped at the decision that wimbledon had made uh, you've got some of the top players in the world not able to compete at one of the biggest tournaments in the world because of the patch of land they were born on. And now with the ATP and WTA stepping in and, and, and making the decision that they have made, suddenly that impacts a whole host of players and even more people are affected. Now, to be honest with you, I'm just going to give my opinion on this. I don't understand why the rankings can't be frozen. During the pandemic, we saw the rankings come to a complete standstill. Well, we skipped Wimbledon in 2020, but at the other Grand Slams, the, the rankings were in limbo for some time. And so I don't understand 
after we've been through months of that, why the same can't be done again instead of everyone's points from the previous year just dropping off. And then it doesn't look too rosy for Wimbledon because they've made the decision they have, but all Novak Djokovic's points fall off and Daniel Medvedev of Russia is world number one. <laughs> I mean, how does that look? So, yeah, it's... Uh, it, it's uh, it's a very difficult one, and it's carnage, and we've not heard the end of it. But I, I just think it's very disappointing that one of the most prestigious events in the world now doesn't carry any ranking points, and it will still carry the prestige. Like I said earlier in the in the stream, twenty years down the line, whoever wins this event on the men's side and the women's side is still going to be a Wimbledon champion. But in terms of now, not only is the playing field not going to be level at Wimbledon, but the play playing field going forwards is not going to accurately um, reflect the status of the tour either. And that's a problem. That is a problem. So, yeah, it sucks, is the, the long story short. Uh, where are we at now? Where are we at now? What are your thoughts on Mimir Kaczmanovic? Now, um, I, I watched a fair bit of Kachmanovic actually uh, towards the back end of the hardcourt season. That was when he really started to pick up and get going. Uh, he's a very awkward player to go up against. Uh, he's got a lot in his locker. He was a very good junior. I, it took a little bit of time to transition. I don't know how much injuries and stuff kind of played a part there, but he, I, I've actually got his name written down when I was looking through the men's draw earlier as a player that can, can be quite dangerous so the names that i wrote down as names that you you want to keep an eye on in that bottom half of the draw are medvedev Tsitsipas, shapovalov rude who opens against joe wilfred songa who's in his final tournament of his career so it would be amazing for him if he can launch an upset there having been to semi-finals here before uh rublev sinner and kachmanovich so yeah he i think he's definitely um wants to keep an eye on as I'm not putting him as down as someone that can go all the way to the trophy, but he, he's definitely someone with the potential to to cause an upset. So yeah, that's my that's my thoughts on him. And that that actually just reminded me of another comment that was left here previously, which was who are your dark horse picks for the event. And that was a confusing one for me actually, because I don't I don't know how do you pick dark horses at this point? with the way things are in the tennis world what classifies as a dark horse if you look at the women's side it's so open there are so many contenders that i don't know how you can go down a step to someone that wouldn't be counted a lead contender but has the potential to do some damage if maybe we're calling you Triontek the the one contender and everyone else that has potential chances as a dark horse i don't know um on, on the men's side I mean, are you dropping down to your Stefanos Tsitsipas's and Alexander Zverev's? Because Tsitsipas was a, a finalist last year. So to call him a dark horse, I don't know, was Stan Wawrinka a dark horse when he won the thing in 20, 2014, the year of the terrible shorts? That was 2014. Yeah, 2014. Because um, that that's probably the kind of, uh level that i would put sits a pass at um the the place the position that Vavrinka was in uh last year not last year <laughs> my word 2014 uh in the you know he you wouldn't have picked him to win the event but he was very capable on clay and had, had decent results on clay ahead of time so yeah i just find it very difficult to actually identify at this point in time what a dark horse is so if anyone has thoughts on that uh, let me know what you think and who you would put in that category because I myself, really not sure, to be completely honest. Uh, <laughs> what's my opinion on Novak Djokovic being anti vax? You really want me to get controversial here, don't you? I hope the viewing figures go up with this. <laughs> um, my opinion on Novak Djokovic being anti vax. Do you know what? Okay, do you know what? I think that if Novak Djokovic who is someone that has always been very careful about what he puts into his body and how he treats his body, who's felt bad in the past over having a simple surgery and that kind of thing, has always been very careful about what he eats and what he consumes. If he 
has real concerns, <clears throat> if he has real concerns about this vaccine, and he's willing to take the consequences that come with that, that come with not wanting the vaccine, and therefore he's banned with the events, and he's okay with that, as he was in Australia, then fair play to him, and actually respect to him for standing by what he believes in a day and age full of, I don't know, cancel culture and everyone coming at you and, and trying to chop you down. Um, I, I think that, you know what, if, if he's willing to to take the fall and he, he knows what he's doing um, in terms of making that decision for himself as someone that has very publicly been very concerned with what he puts into his body over the years, you do you. It is is what I say. So um, yeah, that that's my thoughts on, on Djokovic and the vaccine. But that has been shoved out of the headlines uh, by everything that's happened in recent times. The the tennis world moves quickly, as does the rest of the world. Um, if Nadal plays Felix Uja Aliassime in the fourth round, who will Uncle Tony root for? He's Felix's coach, but Rafa's uncle. Um, yeah, I think he it's win-win for Tony Nadal, right? But actually, I do remember that when he became the coach of Uja Aliassim, it was under the conditions that if Uja Aliassim was to play Nadal, then Uncle Tony, as he's known, would take a step back for those matches. So he wouldn't be directly involved. Now, I don't know if that changes now that he's been with Uja Aliassim for the length of time that he has, but it's in my memory that that was the condition of the partnership in the first place and something that, I mean, Ujjar Ali Asim, he's one of the top players. He's got other people in his team. So he doesn't necessarily, he, I mean, he'd love to have Tony Nadal there and get that insight, but he doesn't need it. So I understand that that would be the situation if they were to face off. As for who Tony would root for, you'd have to ask him that and get his opinion yourself. I can't read his mind, um, but I can guess. I could guess. Um, okay, oh, did you see my question? Hello, welcome back, uh, my friend. What do you think about Radicanu being coachless and dropping coaches with regularity? With her injuries that come with every loss and lack of stamina, I think the physical trainer should be fired. <laughs> okay, okay, funny stuff. Um, or oh, maybe you're being serious. I, yeah, okay, Emma Raducanu, uh, a player that I've been familiar with long before she stormed to that US Open title. Um, I would think that there's more than herself having a say in that coaching situation behind the scenes. I don't think it would be entirely her decision. I think there's probably multiple people getting their word in there um what do i think about it i think that with any situation time will tell i mean she's not the first player to go coachless uh, joe wilfred songer was a, a favorite player of mine growing up and i remember years back that he he said he just wanted to play by instinct and he didn't have a coach for a while and actually was free swinging and, and got some good results at that point in time for radicanu maybe it's a little bit different because uh she's gone from one situation to another so quickly and she's so much younger than Songa was at that point in time. So maybe she needs a little, no, maybe, yeah, I think she's indicated at times that potentially actually she does need a little bit more guidance, but I, I feel for her because there's so much confusion. All this has happened so suddenly that as smart a person as she is, maybe she doesn't even know what she wants or needs at some points in time. Everyone's got an opinion, everyone's coming at you and it's very difficult to, take that on board and kind of roll with that so yeah it's, it's a very it's a very difficult situation for her to be in with everyone having an opinion and understandably the results not coming straight off the back of the us open i've seen someone say it further down the comments i'm sure it'll come to it but look truth be told uh, she did as best she could with it she absolutely stormed through that us open draw but that was far from the toughest Grand Slam draw to a major trophy that you're ever going to see. Raducanu had a nice draw there and credit to her. She's a talent. She was free swinging. She was loving it. She took advantage. But suddenly everyone's expecting her to have the results of a top 10, top 15 player when outside of one tournament in the calendar year, 
her actual ranking is probably between the 80 and 100 mark. Like, you should not be expecting her to win or make the final of every big tournament. And if she does, then great. But if she doesn't, then don't be surprised because that's, that's not her level, right? It's not her consistent level. It's a level that she's capable of, but it's not her day in, day out. And the, the physical side of that shows it, exposes it, that she's got to, got to work her way up to that. The difficulty for her is that a lot of the world don't understand that and therefore she's not offered the patience. So it's even for her, who, who seems to have had a, a good mentality and a, a good mindset and good focus, it's very difficult to shut all that out. So maybe she needs a coach, but only she can make that decision, only her and her team at the end of the day. And that's the full stop on that one, I think. Uh, what makes Iga Sviantec so special? Will she continue to be unbeatable in Roland Garros? Good question. What does make Sviantec so special? And that's a question that I've been asking myself in terms of these results. Now, I I've watched very few of those 28 match wins, I have to say, because I've been working elsewhere. Um, but I mean, I remember her storming to that 2020 Roland Garros title. I remember marking her out as the teenager to watch when she fell into that category herself and Leila Fernandez for me were right up there. Um, she's a very good fit for clay, uh, the top spin that she gets on her ground strokes and there's very little that can go wrong. She's got good technique, like the, the backhand comes straight back. Um, the forehand, she's very confident with the way she controls that. And actually, that's a couple of similarities between her and Barty. Now, I think Barty works a lot on her mentality. I don't think she you would at one point have singled her out as the most mentally tough player. I think she did come unstuck there a couple of times, most notably in Melbourne. Uh, but she definitely did develop ahead for the big moments that's something that as i mentioned earlier you can definitely see in triantec uh, i think they're also two players that were very comfortable kind of going after their forehand a lot more so than other players female players in general a lot of them it's been the case over the years that they prefer their backhand side triantec is just as capable of taking a winner off a new ball on her forehand side she gets she takes the ball so early and so quickly that she's got such good disguise on the shot. And Jibur, you know, she's got such a, a box of tricks to bring out on the court. But in that Rome final, she she wasn't able to because Sviantec was so immediate with her assault, you know, taking the ball so quickly, finishing the points off, that actually it wasn't until several games in that Jibur was able to actually come out with the slice, come out with the drop shot because it's difficult to read where Sriantec is sending the ball. And if you're not one of the best athletes, you want that extra split second to, to get across and cover. And you want to buy yourself a bit of time and she's not giving you that time. So I, I think that's one thing that makes her really tough. The fact that she's got so much disguise on her shots and the fact that she can pull winners out of nowhere and the way she hits reset so quickly and so well. Uh, disappointment she gets over them quickly and I sound like a stuck record maybe that's why I left this channel for a while because I'm giving myself a headache but when you get to this level of the game it is so much more about what's between the ears than what's coming off your racket time and time again I mean that that's what controls it it's the mentality that that really separates players a, a lot of them maybe more so on the ATP side but but, but a lot of the WTA players can, can do a lot of the same things Look, I, I think that players that are more one-dimensional are starting to get exposed but you know everyone can hit forehands and backhands but when do you hit them when do you land them and Sriantec has got that nailed down she knows exactly when she needs to deliver and she does so time and time again she's not winning every game she's not winning every point but she's winning the ones that really matter and, and that's why she is where she is. So I think there's a lot of different little things that come together to make her the weapon that she is. And it's just a question of um, her stamina now, I guess, and how long she can keep that up because everyone has to lose at some point. It would be gutting for her if she could go on this massive win streak and then lose at the major. But I guess that is the biggest test of mentality. And what was I going to come to? Yeah, she got a psychologist, which really helped her kick on in the game. And uh, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of players have kicked on and made their biggest moves after 
maybe maybe favoring a psychologist over a coach that's going to help them with their physical game i think you get to a certain point where you've got to look down the little avenues that, that are going to make a big difference in terms of ranking and in terms of results so yeah the the progress of sri Ontech is quite a fascinating one uh <laughs> do you think we have an adele wonder child bias to alcaraz considering his lack of best of five credibility don't get me wrong the kid is legit yeah okay so th i'm a good <laughs> i'm a good person to ask this question too because uh as as i say if you've been here for a, a time and i keep seeing names that i recognize from across the years so thank you for being here um if you've come here time and time again i've always thrown up that question i've always said okay daniel medvedev is awesome and alexander zverev is proving himself and stefano sits a is a threat but until they've beaten one of the big guys in a best of five set match or on the way to a major title i'm not calling the end of the big three era and i've always been like that that even made me play down medvedev's chances in last year's us open final which he won the fact that he hadn't been able to get the better of djokovic in melbourne earlier in the year when i thought he had a really good shot um medvedev is such a remember way back uh, way back now february there were two or three weeks in February where Daniil Medvedev and Ashley Barty were the world number one. How long ago does that feel now? Little side check there. Uh, but it was great. What a time to be alive. If, if you're here right now, you were there when it happened. That's one for the future. Because um, that's never happening again. Goodbye, Ash. But uh, what was the question now? Um, uh, okay, do, do we think, do we have a bias towards Alcaraz considering the lack of best of five credibility? Do you know what? This is something that I really considered because I was sat there thinking, because I was throwing these questions at Alcaraz internally. I'm like, because I don't hype, you know, I don't like to hype. I don't think it's, uh, it's a uh, very constructive thing. So I'm sat there thinking, okay, so, so what does Alcaraz need to do here? Okay, so, so he's winning these big titles. Now he needs to, to beat one of the bigger names. Okay. He goes and beats Nadal and Djokovic back to back. But does he have a lack of best of five credibility? I mean, I watched him beat Stefano Tsitsipas best of five at the US Open last year, and it was magic at times. And it, it's, um, you look at the way he handles himself in, in big moments in matches, break points down, break points up. Uh, business ends of sets the way he's still willing to to go for that drop shot or step up and rip the forehand and, and that's the thing that really you know stands out when it comes to these big tournaments that's the kind of thing you have to be able to do he was not far off Berrettini I, I commentated on the beginning of that match in Australia and I watched the rest of it courtside he was not far off Matteo Berrettini in that Australian Open third round match at all and they're the last two Grand Slams that he's played that um, defeat of Tsitsipas at the US Open before he had to withdraw in the quarterfinals um, and then the loss to Berrettini in Australia. So I, I don't know that, yeah, he's got a lack of best of five credibility, but I don't think he's coming from nowhere here. Yeah, he's not beaten a Nadal or a Djokovic or one of those guys at a major, but he's not had the opportunity to yet. And so it's, it's a weird situation for me where he's coming into this event um, so inexperienced, but from all these little bits I've seen from him across the season, I think, yeah, he, he could actually do it. Um, I don't have serious concerns about him over best of five because of his mental sharpness. I mean, how grueling was that match that he had with Novak Djokovic in Madrid? The majority of players are losing that match. That, that is where Djokovic specializes in wearing you down physically and mentally and he couldn't do it to Alcaraz not on that day yeah he he was short on practice and not fully at his best but there were some quality quality moments in that match like periods sustained periods of quality tennis and Alcaraz came out on top like he's he's so he's so complete so yeah I I think that yeah I I, I don't think there's a bias there with Alcaraz I think that he's proven himself as much as he can to this point with the opportunities that he's been given I, I there's there's no reason for anyone to say that he he can't actually take what he's been doing elsewhere into best of five sets P 
particularly with how um, filled out he is physically. I remember walking past the outside courts at the Australian Open in January and uh, um, Alcaraz was practicing on the outside courts. And I was like, cool, like he, he's, you know, d developed. He's a great athlete as well as these other kind of mental and skillful components of his game. So, yeah, I, I, it's crazy, but I, I don't think there is bias there. And I think if ever hype was earned, this has been earned by Alcaraz. He, he's answering every question you could ask of him right now. Just the case of whether he will at Roland Garros. Tough draw. My days, if he can come through that. Um, where are we at? Where are we at? I've lost where we are. This had to happen at some point. Found it. Okay. Okay. Mentality makes Iga Sriantek special. She is beatable if the player is aggressive and takes charge. Collins, Ostapenko, and Azarenka. So he gets three love with that. Yes. Exactly. So, so the mentality is the big thing, and um, the the state of the tour across the last the last season reflects why that is the case for Sviantec. I mean, uh, let's look at so let's look at Redicanu's run to the U.S. Open title. Uh, Fencic only had a plan A, went to pieces. Maria Sakkari, second Grand Slam semi final of the year tight as a drum uh, players that are capable and, and can bring that aggressive game that you're talking about but struggle when the spotlight is on them in that way so yes yes indeed i think you've got it there um okay what you're saying about coco golf's draw is exactly what i think about radicanu fernandez played higher quality tennis fell at the last hurdle to the least accomplished and that was the difficulty okay for leila fernandez because um i remember saying at the time i said uh, it's going to feel like robbery if she if she doesn't win this trophy because who did she beat naomi osaka from the brink angelique kerber who was pretty much back in top form arena sabalenka who took the racket out of her hands for a while like fernandez really stepped up but that was then the difficulty for her because she went in her very first and I guess maybe unexpected major final. She went from the underdog to, by status of ranking alone, the favourite. <laughs> that and that was, I think, of the two players in that final, she had the tougher situation because Redicanu, even though internally I think she knew that she should or could win that match in terms of the number next to her name she was still the swinging underdog that she had been the whole tournament through fernandez was suddenly in a very different situation on the very biggest stage and that was uh, a huge deal and understandably one that was kind of too much for her at that moment in time so but she's i think she's kind of held her own since then fernandez it's been nothing kind of mind-blowing but she hasn't gone to pieces in the aftermath of that because her progress up to that point had been a lot more steady like you could pinpoint fernandez a couple of years in advance and say that she was a player to watch so yeah that that's my thoughts on fernandez novak Djokovic hasn't played a five set match since september last year so his physical strength will be tested if he has long matches back to back against Nadal and Alcaraz. Um, yeah, Djokovic is, he used to be such an easy player to predict. And with the, the twists and turns of the last season, it's just not the case anymore. Um, I think still the deeper he gets into a tournament, the more dangerous he is. So maybe Nadal's happy no he's not happy he's not stupid but maybe he, Nadal would rather have him in a quarter final than a final let's say no actually because a final would be played during the day and Nadal wants those daytime conditions so maybe not but um yeah it's funny it, it was it's just strange because Djokovic has been a physical kind of masterpiece for so long has he reached the point where physical strength will be tested i mean we did see that didn't we when he came back from that long break at the beginning of the year i was trying to get back into the swing of matches eventually the three setters that he was playing did catch up to him so it's possible i don't i don't think you can uh for, for djokovic he needs to play a couple rounds for you to kind of really see where he's at it's been a while since as you say we've seen him play best of five tennis so i think he is quite a, a difficult one to call from the offset um yeah, it's, it's tough. Do I see Serena Williams playing Wimbledon? Phew. 
Wow. Serena, is she a thing of the past or a thing of the present? I mean, she disappeared off the scene very quickly. Um, I, I think, what do I say here? I, I would think that it's maybe a widely felt um, feeling <laughs> that Serena is as good as done with the sport. I don't want to, I don't want to say that for sure because I don't know. And uh, if there's anything about Serena over the years, she she loves coming and taking people by surprise and proving people wrong. But I think she knows how many opportunities that she's missed in recent years in terms of being in major finals and having the game to win those major finals and her head, which used to be one of her biggest weapons, completely letting her down after the pregnancy she comes back and she's quite quickly into four or five different grand slam singles finals and had the same issues in all of those finals the first serve went and her composure went with it and i think she knows that so as the years go on as the months go on and time gets shorter and shorter how do you deal with that is that the most important thing to her anymore has she made peace with the fact that she's probably staying on 23 Grand Slam titles. From things that I've heard with her, little interviews and little sound bites here and there, it almost seems to me like she has made peace with that idea that she's known by the majority as the greatest of all time, and this is the career she's had, and other things are waiting, and that is that. Um... It's very hard to say whether she will play Wimbledon or not because she keeps the tennis stuff very private these days. I honestly, in relation to the current tour, and it's incredible to say this as someone that watched Serena so intently growing up, that she was one of my earliest memories of the sport. She was always up there for me as a Grand Slam contender. I don't really think of Serena in relation to the current tour. I mean, we had the pandemic and then she wasn't seen much after that she's just kind of quietly stepped to the side but does she go away that quietly after the career that she's had i think i think she has to come back to finish it off at some point probably i can't say whether that would be wimbledon one thing is for sure the ranking point situation i don't think is going to bother her because uh, i mean she's she's in her 40s now she's not fussed about getting back to world number one the only thing thing that she would keep playing for is that 24th major title so in terms of that being a turn off i would say it's definitely not for serena and uh yeah i guess that's where that thought finishes off do you think kena shikori can make it back to the top 10 recovering from his hip injury and he said he might be back for the us open um i i, I can't sit on the fence if if i'm gonna make a call i don't think so and it pains me to say that, but I think Nishikori, not, I guess maybe in a similar way to Serena, he's at a different stage of his life now. Um, he's married, he's got a kid, and he he had his, oh boy, he had his chance really in, in 2014 when he made the US Open final and he lost to Chilich in, in straight sets. I mean, in, I guess, Andrescu style, he's been hit by injury time and time and time again. And I think he was, unfortunately, was kind of robbed of some of his best opportunities. And when he had that opportunity at the US Open, Chilich peaked for it and he couldn't take it. So I, I just, yeah, I don't think he, I don't think he can play consistently enough, to be honest with you, to make top 10. And he's well on in his career now. I, I unfortunately, I don't think he's doing it. But if he can, so chuffed for him. But I'm not, I'm not even sure if that would be his goal now. It would be very interested to see what keeps him playing. Maybe it's just love of the sport. Someone says, I have a feeling Paola Bedosa is going far this year. Interesting that you say that because her first round match jumped out at me as a tricky one. Wrote it down. I think she's got Fiona Farrow. Yeah, she's got Fiona Farrow round one. Okay, so Farrow, French woman. Um, big forehands. And she's one of the players in recent years. Which year am I thinking of? I'm going to say 2020. I think she made fourth round and lost to Sophia Kennan in three sets. Uh, Roland Karros is so tough for the French players. They tend to crash and burn. 
under the pressure. You'll have one or two that can handle it and go a little bit deeper. Uh, but generally they do find it quite difficult to, to shoulder that home pressure completely feel for them. But Pharaoh is, is someone that has performed before. She's won title on clay. Uh, she's, she's not the easiest first round there. So I think that actually, you know, if Pedosa can navigate that first round, we'll keep an eye on her. But, you know, as, as, one, as a top seed, seeded number three, I, I'd be a little bit maybe concerned for her. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't, I don't think that's the easiest first round for Bedosa there. So yeah, keep an eye on that one. <sighs> Nobody mentions that Novak Djokovic organized free vaccination for anyone that wants to for the Adria tour. That was during 2020. He's only anti-vaccine for himself. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. Look, if you make a personal decision and you're willing to take the consequences that uh, come with that, then fine, go ahead. Uh, da, 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 dark horse wise, says Mark Leafy. Hello, Mark. Uh, thank you for your comments over the years. It would have to be Dominic Team or Casper Rude. I think Team is almost the forgotten man for sure, especially as his results on his comeback have been less than stellar. Yeah, and I mean, this is what stops me from naming team, okay? Because, oh, that, it's the, it's the most heartbreaking thing. He'd worked ridiculously hard to get up to the standard that he was at at the US Open when he won and beat Zverev in the final in 2020. Not the prettiest final, but you cannot argue with his form leading up to it. And of course there were nerves there because it was a huge opportunity. Um, yeah, I, the wrist, my days, talks of when Martin Del Potro about the wrist, you can't get away from it, it's such a tough injury, and I, I think team had worked so hard for so long, and it had taken him so many opportunities to get to that major, there was a little bit of burnout after that result prior to the injury itself, so it's kind of all fallen on top of him, and my goodness, I would love to see him get back to the level he was at, but it is going to be a grind. If anyone can do it, it's team, because he's got the willpower and the motivation and the love of the sport, but uh, this really is trash for him. Uh, he I, Has he won a match on his comeback? I'm not sure that he has. Maybe he's won one, but I, I think because I've actually a little bit of team coming back just to try and engage that. Um, but he's been getting frustrated because he, he's able to play, but the, the big moments, the rustiness is really showing itself. Uh, and with the physicality that's required over the five, yeah, he'd have to be a very, very dark horse at Roland Garros. And I was talking to one of my sisters about this two days ago. Um, and about how he played Nadal in two Roland Garros finals and Nadal was like, oh, for sure you will win this at some point in the future. And it just goes to show you never know what's going to happen because with his level on clay in recent years, he was deservedly the Prince of Clay. He beat Novak Djokovic at two Roland Garros events. You know, he had everything going for him to win this title, apart from the fact that Nadal was on the scene and still peaking when he needed to. And now now it's a long road back for team. So yeah, he would be a very dark horse uh, from my from my perspective. Oh, nice, easy, nice, easy answer here. Clip this and post it if I'm wrong. The question is, can Karolina Pliskova win Roland Garros? I'm going to say no. <laughs> uh, no, she can, okay? Look, she can do it. Anyone could conceivably do it. But Pliskova has just been so close for so long. I put her in the in the boat along with Elena Zvitolina and I think Arena Sabalenka is kind of there now. And even Maria Sakkari, players that have kind of been pushing for so long. But there's a ceiling to what they can do on the court. And they always fall at the final or the penultimate hurdle. And before long, that becomes a mental block as well as there being a ceiling to their physicality. So... Look, Pliskova's gone deep at Roland Garros before. She's made semi-finals. So, yeah, she, she's a little bit of uh, a dark horse, I guess, on clay because you would not necessarily expect it to be the best fit for her game. But no way is she a top contender for me at this point in time. Come back if she makes the final four or the final itself. But no, I'm not calling it, I'm afraid, at this point. Casper Ruud has a nice draw, has good form on clay. And I like his mental calmness. If you really want an outsider, I guess clay court specialist Garin would be the man. Okay, so we're saying here that Rude is not a dark horse, more of a kind of outside contender. 
Does that equate to a dark horse? I really don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, Gar Garen would be... Could, is Garen enough to be a dark horse, though? I feel like Rude is maybe up here, and Christian Garen's maybe there, and dark horse is somewhere in the middle, is my feeling, I think. I think... Um, question from Edgar. Hello, Edgar. Good to see you. How far can Amanda and Isamova go in this event this year? Well, I know her opener is Naomi Osaka. It's a rematch of their clash at the Australian Open. I went courtside to watch the end of that on Margaret Court Arena. Some of the best hitting that I've seen. Sheer, slow travelling, power hitting. Usually the kind of duel that Osaka would come out on the upper hand of. And yet Anisimova... I've never felt so sure that Osaka's going to lose a match from that position. She had match point, I think, and she was so close, but Inisimova just had total um, focus in the situation and the ability to time the ball so well and absorb and redirect what was coming at her from Osaka and, and, and make Osaka feel, um, feel the moment there and feel the effects of her shot. So I... Yeah, I think that's a, a really tough opener for Osaka. So if Anisimova comes through that, then I think she could, she's a contender, I think. I think Anisimova's a contender. It's very easy to forget, um, with all the hype around other players since then, that when she was 17, she made the semi-finals of this event. She absolutely thrashed Simona Halep on the way, and she was a set and a breakup on Ashley Barty in the semi-finals. Barty then went on to win the event. And I, I felt like maybe it wasn't the case in America. I'm not from the States, so I can't speak on this, but it, it just felt like, particularly for a player that had been so well spoken of prior, uh, there wasn't a lot of hype around that run for uh, Anisimova, which, hey, I'm not a big fan of the hype, so maybe that's a good thing, but yeah, I think I think that there's no reason why Anisimova shouldn't actually be right up there with the contenders, apart from the fact that she's not really, she's not a winner of big titles. But otherwise, I think she's proven that she can beat all the players that she needs to beat and that she has the game and that her game can transfer across surfaces. So why not? OK, we're over an hour. We're approaching an hour and 15. I'm going to finish the questions that we have here. Then I'm going to wrap it up for now. Um, by all means, subscribe to the channel. I mean, this was a little bit impromptu, this return. Um, I had people, thank you, asking me when I was going to come back to YouTube and saying that they missed me here, which I really appreciated. Um, I can't say for sure what my upload schedule will be like during Roland Garros. Uh, some of you will know that I was there last year commentating for the World Feed. Not the case this year. The team got cut and uh, I'm on the outside. Not salty at all. <laughs> you know, it was a great experience last year and uh, not in Paris this year, which means that I, I have more flexibility to do stuff. I'm not sure that we would do a round by round live Q&A like we used to, but there's definitely potential to do an end of week one Q&A or stuff like that. So, um, yes, yeah, so if you're interested, subscribe and put the notifications bell on and you'll know when I'm doing whatever I'm doing and, and maybe a prediction or two in the second week. So any chance Taylor Fritz will make a deep run? Uh, depends on his draw. Am I really going to trawl through the draw now and find Taylor Fritz? Because I cannot remember where he... Uh, was when I checked it earlier. Does anyone know whether he's top half or bottom half? If you tell me now, I'll, I'll see it come up. So if, if anyone knows exactly where... Ah, got him! Okay, so he opens against a qualifier. Then he plays a qualifier or a wild card. Now that's quite deceptive, okay? Because you can say that quite casually and be like, oh, win, win. Not necessarily the case. I mean, he's got... Um, the, the guy he's playing round one, I've never watched the Argentinian, Rodriguez to Werner. Is that poor that I've never seen him play? I shouldn't have admitted it, but... So, it's, I mean, so I would imagine that he wins that opening match, but, um, I mean, the potential second rounds are Michael Moe and Zephyr Morales, who are both really capable players. So, I think sometimes it's tough when you've got what looks like a more open and a more winnable draw. There's a, the pressure that comes with that and the mental aspect of it gets very interesting. He's also got John Isner on the horizon for round three and Isner's a clay court underdog. So yeah, it's a little bit neither here nor there with Fritz, to be honest with you. I mean, 
heck of a win for him at Indian Wells. Uh, he steps up and it, his forehand is biting and he's got a, a much more impressive game these days, but I wouldn't necessarily have called him winning Indian Wells. So, yes, indeed. That's where I'm at. Uh, Nadal's forehand was haywire throughout Madrid and Rome. Is it because of lack of match practice? Or does having a foot injury limit the lethality of his forehand? Well, it definitely limits his movement, okay? And if you can't move, you can't line up for the forehand. So I think that he's not going to make excuses, but you know, it's been a... The injury has been... This is an injury that he's carried throughout the majority of his career. In recent times, it's been more intense than it has been previously. I, yeah, even, even though it's the foot and not the hands, like, everything contributes. So... I think that, well, would it be lack of match practice for Nadal? I mean, even though he'd not played on, on clay, he played a lot on hard courts leading up. I think in a situation like that, there are multiple factors, I think is the bottom line. So that would be my answer there. <laughs> Your accent seems to have Americanized since I last heard you. Uh, the accent, my friends, is a constant talking point. 80% of people, okay, I don't know what you would say, 80, I would say good 80% of people ask me if I'm Australian or say that I sound Australian. It's beginning to scare me because actually people that I've known since birth are starting to say the same thing. I went to Melbourne, the girl that's doing my PCR test can't believe that I'm not a local. Um, and then American comes up a little bit as well. Um, it's nothing deliberate, I took just the more of this stuff that I do, it just, I don't know, seems to happen. But uh, hopefully it's not annoying, is all I can say. But enough people have said it that I can't say nothing's happened. It's, it's, uh, keeps coming up. Uh, Kane Shikori still says he loves to play in interviews. Well, good for him. And if he does love to play, then long may it continue. Uh, would you like to go and commentate in the USA on challenges if there are gaps in UK Pro League? could be great with Mike Cation. He's very funny. Uh, Mike Cation's a friend of mine. Shout out to Mike if he happens to be here or whatever he is. Uh, Mike's a legend. So committed to the challenger game. And uh, I, know, I know he's working on some college tennis at the moment. Uh, knows his stuff. Great. Passionate. And... Uh, yeah, I think myself and Mike and others kind of understand that uh, the level is there at that, those kinds of events. They don't have the status and they don't have the money poured into it and they don't have the attention, but the level of play is there and that's something that we want to try and promote. So yeah, if the opportunity ever arose, would love to go to the States and would love to do some challenges. I've done some challenges previously here in the UK, um, but we'll see. We'll see what the future holds. And that's a, a nice place to wrap this up. Well, thank you to everyone that hung around. It's been nice to be back. Thank you for joining in. Uh, it's been interesting to kind of hear your questions and, and read your perspectives. As I say, I've been a little more out of the loop leading up to Roland Garros than I, I would have been in previous years. But it's uh, actually going through this has reminded me of some matches that I actually forgot that I had watched and, and things that I have actually been on top of. So it's been quite encouraging for me, actually, that may maybe I'm more in the loop than I, I thought I was. One thing is for sure, I'll be keeping on top of Roland Garros, and I hope that you will too. And I hope that if I get back on this channel, you'll be here as well. So uh, do subscribe and hit the notifications bell if you want to be aware of anything I'm uploading during the event, because I doubt that I won't be here at all during what is going to be a very interesting tournament so hopefully see you soon thank you for being here thank you for your questions thank you for making it fun and thank you always for the support uh, i don't always get to reply to everything but tweets dms encouragement comments i see them i appreciate them uh, i'm really grateful so thank you very much and i'm gonna wrap it up the way i used to thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.